Okay, welcome to another video on my channel, gun related video. Um, now today we're going to do just a short video, it's actually a historical uh, video actually. It's probably one that I've, I mean I often include history in my videos but they're usually specifically uh, you know weapons reviews or whatever but we're not going to do it today. Today it's completely history. I do have my BSA uh, Martini Cadet here and um, and we're going to talk about history and then we're going to link it with the Martini Cadet Rifle in Australia. Now, what we're talking about today is the Hague Convention. Um, so just a bit of background about that. You may or may not have heard of that. Most people have heard of the Geneva Convention. That was in, back in the 1920s that started. Well, and that's to do with the uh, behaviour of, of uh, soldiers and, and, and combatants during wartime. Um, but there was earlier conventions uh, than that. Now the first one that we're actually, um, uh, that's directly related to what we're talking to today was called the St. Petersburg Declaration. So there was a, a conference in St. Petersburg in Russia in 1868. Um, and what they did there was they uh, banned the um, any projectiles now first of all you, you let's go back and think about what sort of small arms did they have in 1868 that was back during the days of the black powder large bore cartridge rifles um, and generally these they had projectiles of four to five hundred grain, grains or something like that um, which is how many grams is that um, I'll actually put it in. The, I'll put it on the screen to show you how many grams those bullets are. But anyway, at the St. Petersburg Declaration of 1868, they banned exploding projectiles of less than 400 grams. Uh, so it's not a particularly big. It's probably bigger than your average rifle projectile, but it's smaller than any artillery projectiles. Along with weapons designed to aggravate injured soldiers or make their death inevitable. So that included things as well as exploding projectiles, it included things like um, putting, uh, you know, like putting, you know, they used to, this used to happen, I've read about this, they put feces on the projectiles so that if you got, even if you got shot in the arm, for example, the infection would definitely kill you in those pre-antibiotic days or poisons, you know, they put cyanide or something at the end of the projectile so again you may have a non-lethal wound but you would die and so it says or make their death inevitable so that makes anything like that not allowed uh, in a uh, war situation. Now if we come back to um, small arm projectiles in the early 1880s there was a revolution in small arms, especially military small arms design. Uh, there was two main uh, things. The first one of course was the uh, was the advent of smokeless powder. This allowed much higher pressures, um, much more efficient uh, driving of a projectile and then of course you had also had the physical benefit of not having clouds of smoke, smoke um, obscuring what you were trying to shoot at. And also showing your enemy where you were when you fired a shot and there's a big cloud, cloud of smoke they could shoot back at you. But when we're talking about the, the, the benefit to the actual efficiency of the cartridge itself, so then they were able to produce small, what they called it those time, in those times, small bore cartridges, much higher velocity than what they've been shooting. And um, they quickly learned that they needed to put a metal jacket on the cartridge to stop uh, black powder, um, to stop lead fouling. Um, you know, you had the benefit of not no longer having black powder fouling, but if you drive a lead ball too fast, you'll get, it, the lead will actually melt from the friction and you'll get lead into the barrel. So they had to actually put um, a jacket on the bullet. Now, um, so during that time, um, let's, if we just look at the British, uh, the British firearms, they, they the first 303 cartridges were black powder and they very quickly um, designed the Mark II 303 cartridge which was smokeless 
uh, but it had a solid metal projectile. But then the Mark III and IV, um, I think they were, projectiles, um, they actually made them a hollow point. Um, now, um, I've got a, uh, an excerpt from the British Medical Journal from December 19, 1896. And this is someone writing in um, to the journal. And it doesn't actually say who wrote it, but it's only an excerpt from it. But I'll read it out to you, it's quite interesting. The military bullet. We believe that it was in these columns that attention was first called to the fact that the Lee Metford bullet caused, especially at close quarters, so small a wound that it was not suitable for stopping a determined rush and would thus be ineffectual to prevent hand-to-hand -hand fighting. The accuracy of this opinion was disputed at the time, but the experience during the Chitral campaign shows that it was well grounded. The bullet traverses the soft parts without smashing and even pierces through the bones without splitting them. It is reported that one tribesman who had been hit by six bullets was treated in hospital and made a good recovery. In consequence, the military authorities intend to turn their attention to the task of making a leaf Metford bullet which, without losing its ranging power, will still inflict a wound sufficiently severe to stop a rush. The correspondent of the time states that such a bullet has been devised by Captain Bertie Clay, RA, superintendent of the Dum Dum Ammunition Factory, and that public trials with it have proved it to fulfil all the conditions required. So now we need to talk about the Dum Dum. You've probably heard of Dum Dum bullets. It's a term used, it's often used by anti-gun zealots um, when they're talking about any sort of modern expanding bullet, you know, because it's a bit of sensationalist. But what it was, the Dum Dum was actually the British ammunition factory in India. Uh, and it was there that they actually had, had identified this problem and they uh, did some um, experiments in working out ways to get the Mark II 303 ammunition to expand uh, and what they did was they actually cut a cross in the tip of it um, and it was quite effective in making it expand but it wasn't particular despite all the hype and the fact that you hear about it all the time it wasn't particularly um, successful in that it uh, changed the ballistics of the, of the, uh, of the round uh, reduced accuracy all sorts of um, and that there was a potential that the, the jacket could um, shed in the barrel, uh, you know, which would be catastrophic when you find the next round. So, but it was just, that was just generally the, the general thinking. Um, but yeah, so, but then the, the British did uh, design hollow points in their bullets and um, uh, which actually uh, increased expansion in the Mark III and IV um, 303s. Um, now it was during the Battle of on Durman in 1898, that was actually um, just uh, in the Sudan, near Khartoum, um, you know, there was a lot of fighting went on between the local tribes of people and the British uh, in the Khartoum area. I think the British were actually defeated in the end there, um, under an hour. but um, apparently during this battle of Om Durman, the British had the um, the Mark IV 303 ammunition um, and it was actually uh, noted that because they had been fighting the Sudanese um, with the earlier patterns of solid ammunition um, less successfully and it was noted how much more effective the, um, the Mark IV ammunition was and the fact that it actually expanded uh, and put down the, um, the Sudanese tribesmen much more quickly um, and apparently some of the peop some of the soldiers who were issued with the earlier ammunition were actually you know, filing the tips off them to try to make them expand better. Now, um, in 1898, the Germans actually um, complained that about the, the, the British bullets, saying that they were um, inhumane and um, so during the Hague Convention of 1899 which was another one of these conventions where all the countries got together in the Hague and talked about the rules of war amongst other things um, 
the, the Germans may put this complaint to the Hague Convention. The British, in their defence, attempted to justify the use of the dum-dum-dum-dum bullet, meaning an expanding bullet, um, by pointing to its utility when putting down colonial unrest. Development developed by the British to stop the rush of fanatical tribesmen, and the bullets were vigorously defended by Sir John Ardar against the heated attack of all except the American military delegate, Captain Crozier, whose country was about to make use of them in the Philippines. Now, if you watch any of, uh, if you watch a Thias um, on C and Arsenal on YouTube, um, you, a lot of people watching this probably are familiar with him. If you're not, you sh and you're interested in any sort of military firearms, you should go and watch him. There's hundreds of hours of, uh, of uh, historical data on military firearms. No, they're only up to the First World War at the moment, mind you. Um, but they, uh, Captain Crozier often comes up in that. William Crozier was a um, career artillery officer. Um, now, if you watch um, Athias on CN Arsenal channel, um, on YouTube, you would have seen mention of William Crozier quite a few times. He was, uh, late after 1901, he was made Brigadier General and was actually Chief of Ordnance for the US Army. So he was the one that made the final decision, really, I think, on uh, what firearms were to be adopted. Um, so he's very big in the, um, in the story of uh, new firearms development in the United States. Uh, but um, in 1899 he was a captain of the US Army and uh, uh, was um, was the chief American delegate at the Hague Convention uh, of 1899. And those of you who are real fans of CN Arsenal uh, will be aware that Athias named his guinea pig Crozier after William Crozier. Uh, and in the Philippines, uh, the Americans had had this same problem against the Moro tribesmen in the previous years. Uh, they found that they Craig Jorgensen um, rifles in 3040 with solid uh, projectiles were having the same problem. And also, they had gone to a 38 caliber revolver, uh, which didn't have enough power to stop rampaging tribesmen. And that was the reason why, in the early 20th century, the Americans, or one of the reasons why the Americans you know, specified that they needed to go back to 45 for their handgun. Um, anyway, in here, uh, so Sir John Ardar, who's the British delegate. In warfare against the savages, Ardar explained to an absorbed audience, men penetrated through and through several times by our latest pattern of small calibre projectiles, which make small clean holes, were nevertheless able to rush on and come to close quarters. Some means had to be found to stop them. The civilised soldier, when shot, recognises that he is wounded and knows that the sooner he is attended to, the sooner he will recover. He lies down on his stretcher and is taken off the field to his ambulance, where he is dressed and bandaged. Your fanatical barbarian, similarly wounded, continues to rush on, spear or sword in hand, and before you have time to represent to him that his con conduct is in fragrant violation of the understanding relative to the proper course for the wounded man to follow, he may have cut off your head. So, how the rest of the, uh, when they came to the vote at the Hague Convention in 1899, the British and the Americans voted against the resolution to ban expanding bullets. However, 20, the 22 other countries, so the vote was 22 to 2 to prohibit the use of expanding projectiles. So um, it's actually um, Declaration Number 4, Part 3 of the Hague Convention states, it's or well, the name of the declaration is Declaration Concerning the Prohibition of the Use of Bullets Which Can Easily Expand or change their form inside the human body, such as bullets with a hard covering that does not completely cover the core or containing indentations. So there you go. So there's the Hague Convention talking about. And that's why in all the 20th century battles, um, you had what's called ball ammunition, both rifle and pistol and, and machine gun. Um, 
which is a solid metal jacket, a full metal jacket as they call it. Um, now, so now we come, so that's where it comes from. So, you know, Australia's sort of, uh, even though Australia wasn't even a country in 1898, um, it, uh, it, I guess, followed the British. So anyway, then we come to uh, World War Two. Now, let's just have a brief um, history of the Martini Cadet Rifle. Um, there was a variety of patterns. The very early ones were in the 1890s. Uh, they were issued to the very early ones were in 297, 230 Morris. Um, tiny little small ball cartridges. Um, and they were issued to the, uh, the colonies because at the time Australia wasn't a country, they just had colonies. There was uh, New South Wales, Victoria, Queensland, etc. And um, so they were issued to the colonies. Now, the second pattern of it, Martini Cadets, began to be issued from what I can read about 1909 and it went through, um, I'm not sure that they issued it during the First World War, possibly they did, but um, anyway, from 1909 through to 1919, from, from what I read. There was purchases of these. Numbers varied, I've read from between 20,000 and 80,000. 60,000 seems to be the, the most common. Cadets were very active, but um, pretty much by the mid 20s, I think, after the First World War and the soldiers came back, I think there was a plethora of number one Mark III and number one Mark III star Lee Enfield SMLEs. Um, and so I think it was just decided that if, if the cadets were going to you know, be proper military cadets, they'd shoot proper military rifles. And so they still kept these, they're in storage, but they don't seem to have used them very much from that time. They, they, were used, they used the 303s. So let's fast forward to the Second World War. Um, by 1942, the Japanese have basically occupied the whole of Southeast Asia. They've taken Burma, Malaya, Singapore, um, imprisoning many, many thousands of Australian servicemen at the time. Um, they're over there throughout the full of the full Indonesian archipelago, um, including Timor, and they're um, they're on the north coast and northern islands of uh, Papua, or what's Papua New Guinea then, but New Guinea. Um, they're in the Pacific, the Solomon Islands. Uh, and all the Micronesia. Um, so Australia was getting to the stage where invasion seemed almost inevitable. Um, we were the, there was a um, surprise bombing raid on in uh, Darwin. Oh, I can't remember the date. I'll put it on the screen. And Darwin was bombed many times. I think. Um, all the towns throughout the north of Australia were bombed at least um, a few times. Um, Derby and Wyndham in Western Australia, um, Darwin, Broome, um, uh, Horn Island, the airfield uh, up in the Torres Strait at the top end of Queensland. I'll put a map. Um, The east coast of Australia was also um, also attacked. Um, Townsville was shelled at one stage, I think, from a submarine. The beachside suburbs of Sydney were shelled from a submarine. And uh, of course there was the famous um, attack by the two miniature subs, which got into Sydney Harbour past the nets, and um, they aimed a, aimed a torpedo at a, uh, at a um, a warship but hit a ferry instead and sunk it to lots of people. So things were looking pretty dire. Um, however, most of the Australian um, active service people were serving either in North Africa or in the Pacific, uh, New Guinea. Um, and so just like the UK, the, the powers that be decided we needed a home guard, so a home guard was sort of formed. Now, I don't think it was ever expected that they were going to be any um, 
have any success against invading Japanese forces. Um, but you know, Home Guard is just to keep an eye on the home front, you know, watch out for spies, maybe capture downed airmen, if, if just like in, in the UK where where um, German planes were often shot down by enemy lines and the locals would come along with their shotguns or whatever and take him prisoner and take him to the authorities. So that sort of thing I think I was thinking of. And of course they had tens of thousands of Martini cadets on the racks in the armories. So they um, they issued them um, to these home guard. And uh, most very, very likely this one here was probably issued to someone somewhere Let's go to uh, ammunition. So if you look at the top of the barrel of the Martini Cadet Rifle, and it says, it's got a proof mark there, and then it says 310-12-120. Um, and uh, that's actually the load that it's, um, that wouldn't be the load that it was proofed at, it would have been proofed at a higher load, but that's the pro load that the proof pr shows is safe to use. Um, so that's 310 calibre, um, 12 grains of whatever powder, it would have been a fine pistol powder probably, probably similar sort of powder they used in, in um, you know, revolvers, small, small bore revolvers of the day, and 120 grain bullet. So the military, you know, back during this time, the military actually issued um, uh, that load for the cadets use, it was a lead projectile, Here's a uh, original uh, drawing from Kynock of the 310 Cadet 120 grain lead uh, load. Um, I believe initially Kynock actually made the ammunition. They probably ordered ammunition with the rifles. Um, but I think later on that was actually made uh, in Australia, although I really can't find any information on that. So I don't have an original military issue um, 310 round, but this is a, uh, a Kynock, an original Kynock sporting, it's a hollow point sporting cartridge. It's 120 grain um, lead projectile, um, probably from the 1920s or something like that. So it would be a very similar, um, similar cartridge to that. I'll, I'll see if I can find, I might be able to find a photo of an original cartridge on the net and just plug it into the video to show you what they look like but anyway so the military of course they had all these tens of thousands of rifles and they probably had many hundreds of thousands of rounds of ammunition in storage as well most likely um, but or maybe they didn't maybe they did there was ammunition run down um, but what they had, of course, was lead projectile, and uh, once the uh, because of the Hague Convention, a lead projectile, even just a, you know without a hold point, uh, was actually illegal because lead projectiles actually expand when they hit the human body. So projectiles had to be jacket, full metal jacket. So so in order to issue these to the Home Guard during the Second World War, they had to then develop some, um, some full metal jacket ammunition loads for them. And um, so they did. Uh, they were manufactured in the small arms, that's the small arms uh, ammunition factory down in Geelong. And, um, and that comes to why I kind of made this video in the first place. Um, just reach over here. I've got this, this bag. Remember, I was at a I was at a gun show. Um, that one there I've had in my collection for a while. I actually, I someone gave me a half a box of those once, and I fired them all off and just kept one for for um, their burden crime. Um, but I was at this gun show, and there was a guy who had all boxes of old ancient ammunition and boxes falling apart and all that. And I always have a bit of a look through that and uh, down below all these, it was in big kind of wooden boxes and down below I could see a few cases kicking around underneath the um, these boxes of ammunition. So I asked the guy if I could just pull all, pull all the boxes out and see what was there, so he goes for it. So I had a bit of a scratch around and because one of these cases I'd seen I thought I, could, I, couldn't, I couldn't grab it, I could only see it and I thought that looks 
like a, uh, a 310 uh, cadet case. And so I had it kicked around and I ended up uh, finding 28 super 310 cases. So that's where I've got all my super cases, just like that. I just find a few here or there, because uh, that's all I use as super cases. And there was even a couple of them. Um, these are the original super. So this is what the super ammunition looked like back in the 1950s and 60s. Uh, when it was available, that's where all these cases came from. So there's a couple of original super rounds um, there. 120 grain semi watt cutter lead projectile. Uh, but in amongst them was uh, these as well. So we've got one here. In amongst them was those, uh, and as soon as I saw those, even though I'd never actually, I'm not a cartridge collector. I mean, these aren't particularly rare, I don't think. I think every serious cartridge collector would have these in their collection, but I'd heard about them, but never actually seen one. I might, you know, I might have seen one in a cartridge collection somewhere. But, uh, but anyway, uh, as soon as I saw them, I knew what they were. They were I knew that they were World War II vintage. Um, Full metal jacket cartridges that were were um, issued for Martini cadet use by the Home Guard, and of course the Japanese never invaded, and uh, the cadets never fired a shot in anger. The World War Two era Ball 310 cadet cartridges were 125 grain full metal jacket cartridge. There seem to be several different patterns. Uh, there's a round nose one uh, and the, the most common ones seem to be pointed. Uh, apparently the early ones had stick type cordite and the later ones uh, had powder and they weren't apparently very accurate. But anyway, I just thought that was an interesting story, uh, a bit of history, a lot of like the cadet, so directly related to cadet. So um, if, you, if you got this far, you're probably a bit of a history buff like me, so I hope you enjoyed it. Um, please like and subscribe if you like this sort of stuff. Until next time, thanks for watching.